Hey everyone, um, I wanted to make a video to talk about uh, dramatic monologues and observational and ecrastic poems and uh, hopefully set hopefully set your minds at ease a little bit about the poetry portfolio, which is the last assignment of the semester. And it is the one that, of course, gives students the most anxiety um, because it's uh, the hardest because uh, not only does it require the most attention to detail, but it's also the genre that we are, uh, generally speaking, the least familiar with. I mean, even if you're not familiar with flash fiction, you're at least familiar with fiction. And so, you know, it's just a shorter version of that, whereas poems um, are things that most people uh, try to avoid uh, for some terrible, terrible reason. Um, anyway... So I, I decided last year uh, to require students to write a dramatic monologue and an observational poem because mostly what I was getting was just uh, sort of like individual thoughts or beliefs um, uh, broken up into lines and stanzas or uh, students who would force their, you know, force themselves to write a sonnet um, and, and that's incredibly hard to do. So in any event, the dramatic monologue uh, is, uh, it's like a fun type of poem to write. Um, it's for me, it's always been a really great way to sort of break out of writer's block. Like if I, if I look at somebody, uh, I see someone or read about someone who's interesting in some way um, to try to sort of put yourself in their shoes, in their lives, and write a poem from their perspective is is pretty fun. So, like, I wrote a few uh, in my first book, one where I was this landlord who lived at the corner of 12th and Piedmont that my wife and I would see every day when we'd go walk our dogs, and uh, he ended up, you know, he was sort of one of those guys who was kind of drunk by noon and acting pretty crazy. And then I wrote another one, um, in the voice of this composer Schumann, uh, who, uh, went insane because, um, he, he started hearing a single note just constantly in his ear. I think it was an A minor and he just heard it until it drove him mad and, and he attempted suicide. And then, uh, I wrote a funnier one, I think, a, a more cheerful one about, I've always been interested in the lives of, you know, like carnies, like when you go to the fair or something like that, um, or a carnival, um, or a festival and all these people who just sort of travel, you know, from t festival to festival to festival, setting up their booths and selling kettle corn or, or building the Ferris wheels or whatever it is. Um, and I thought about what an interesting life that might be. And so it allows you to sort of break free from yourself. Um, and so, uh, forgive me if this is, um, repetitive, but, uh, Senor Wentz is in the man in the box. I'll let you take a look at, you know, you can look up, I'm sure you've all already read Lady Lazarus and, and Love Song of Joe for Proofrock, but um, something to remember is that the, the voice needs to remain unbroken, okay? So you assume the voice of a speaker and it remains unbroken and it addresses an audience. And in Senior Wentz's in The Man in the Box, the poet, uh, Leon Stokesbury, assumes the voice of his dead father. So the voice of the poem is the dead father. L.B. Stokesbury, and it is addressing the son, who is Leon Stokesbury, the poet. So the speaker in the poem is the dead father addressing the son, who in real life is the poet, which is kind of a cool, uh, I don't know, crazy way to look at things. And so um, he, as you can see in the poem, um, you know, I don't need to, to read it for you or anything like that. Uh, the, the father and son did not have a peaceful relationship. You know, it talks about finding some demilitarized zone between the two of them. Um, you know, this stanza right here, uh, Laddie Buck. And Laddie Buck, of course, is a unique phrase that um, I'm sure the father used. If we could have found some demilitarized zone, which we could not. If I could for once have raised you up out of your maze of corridors, which I could not. You with your boxcars of words, words, words. Little links of ink lined up all in a row, chugging off toward the horizon. 
Maybe then I could have told you what you wanted to hear. And so you see the relationship between the two is uh, brought to light through the voice of the father. And so, uh, you know, it develops this incredibly, I think I've, I don't know if I've already said this, Senor Wences was a performer who would go on like the Ed Sullivan show. And the man in the box was, uh, uh, Senor Wences was, um, uh, the name of the ventriloquist doll. So in a way, Leon Stokesbury is being a ventriloquist by assuming the voice of his father. And so the man in the box here is, you know, his father, uh, just like the doll would be in the box that you take out of the box and bring it up on the stage. And so as the uh, casket, the lid is closing down, um, we see the last words that uh, Leon Stokesbury, the poet, uh, imagines or hopes that his father could have or would have said to him to offer some sort of peace. And it gets very intense um, at the end. Instead, only this, myself disassembling, desires to consign my pressing embassy that would have come, could have come, should have come sooner, I concede. Myself answering, Sisyphus, son, the lid coming down now, ash white, better late than never answering, ending thus the last refrain, jokester, prankster, son, just a tiny crack left now, it's all right. And if you Googled it, it's all right was the catchphrase of uh, Senor Wences. And so here is a son uh, sort of praying uh, that his father would forgive him for sort of the, the difficult relationship that they had. It's a, it's a tremendously moving poem, but if you, uh, you know, read it and read any of these dramatic monologues with a careful eye, you see that, um, you know, what's most important is to be as, uh, to maintain fidelity and be as true to the voice that you're assuming as possible and to stay in character the whole time. Uh, and so you can pick anybody. Uh, it's a really fun and um, and freeing experience to write a dramatic monologue, but you know you're also writing a narrative, so it forces you to stay within that uh, that type of a poem. Now, ekphrastic and observational poems, um, which I've included only two of here. I think I, I included two of my own as well, but I don't like talking about my poems, so I'm not going to do that. This is a famous one by Auden uh, from the poem Fall of, the Icar Fall of Icarus by Peter Bruegel, which you can look up and read all about um, uh, as you want. Refrigerator 1957 by Tom Lux is not an ekphrastic poem because it does not address a specific work of art. Tomorrow, um, I am going to scan... See the four or five or six poems that the new poet laureate of Georgia, uh, Chelsea Rathbun, included in her most recent book, where uh, uh, it's uh, paintings of Medea, who, if you don't know, you can Google that, um, and, and its relationship to her experience as motherhood. So I'll include those as well. Now, this poem takes a look at something totally uh, uh unpoetic really in a way that you might imagine just a refrigerator filled with a jar of maraschino cherries and maraschino cherries as you know are cheap not even refrigerated candied bright red cherries that you get at kroger for like a dollar fifty the point of the poem though is that uh it means something to him this ugly refrigerator with terrible food and these uh worthless cherries um mean a lot to him because as he says, uh, the same jar, the same jar of cherries, oops, through an entire childhood of dull dinner, right? Of dull dinners, bald meat, pock peas, and see above boiled potatoes, right? So that the cherries, like, they're a symbol of his childhood, which is a symbol of innocence and a symbol of loss that, of course, is irrevocable, right? Anything that reminds you of childhood is uh, perhaps joyful and uh, melancholic because you're never going to get it back. And so one of the things that if you're writing an observational poem about a person or a place or a thing is try to find something that's unique to your life. Try not to, to I mean, 
if you were to write an observational poem about, uh, I included watching an old man watch the sea, which is just a man. It's actually, you know, sort of about my father. But uh, if you're writing it about your grandma or something like that, or, or your lover or whoever it is, everyone has those things, right? So you have to find a way into what makes that person, that place, or that thing unique. And then how does that, uh, how do you develop meaning that is uh, important to you and then therefore can be important to your reader through your observation, okay? So the cool thing about observational and ekphrastic poems is that it forces you to stay razor sharp on looking at and commenting on the way something looks, smells, tastes, feels, sounds, um, you know, unique phrases, uh, anything like that, you know, so, uh, or, you know, what is entirely unique to you, you might have something like a jar of maraschino cherries that to other people has no value at all, but to you does have value and you can bring forth that value through your own observations because as Tom Luck says here, which is just wonderful, right? They were beautiful these cherries, right? They were beautiful. And if I never ate one, it was because I knew it might be missed or because I knew it would not be replaced. And because you do not eat that which rips your heart with joy. Um, thinking about those cherries rips his heart with joy. And, and just think about how much better, this is how specific and difficult poetry is, how much better that last line is because it's rips your heart with joy instead of breaks your heart with joy. Because we've all heard breaks your heart. Right, but we have not heard rips your heart, and so a simple little thing like including a new word uh, that is within the syntax of the poem uh, can be powerful. So, uh, we're gonna have more examples of these. I hope this helps a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this with any of you via email or swing by the office or send me drafts, and um, you know, we can go from there. All right, so have great days, and I'll see you later.